Hello, folks. Good afternoon. It is just after one o'clock. I want to welcome uh, anyone who's joined us and is, is uh, joining us now. Uh, my name is Martin Daly. I'm the Director of Water Quality Programs for CDRPC, and today's webinar is Review Board Procedures, the Who, What, and How to Achieve Development Success. This webinar is made possible by presenting sponsor Barton and Lung Judas, and I want to thank them for their support. We really could not do it without our presenters and our sponsors, and they're wearing both hats, so I really appreciate that. Joining me today is Molly Gaudusso, AICP, and John Steinmetz, FAICP of Barton and Lung Judas. Uh, before we begin, I do want to do a little bit of housekeeping to remind you where the fire exits are. For those of you that do not know us, CDRPC is a regional planning and resource center that serves Albany, Rensselaer, Saratoga, and Schenectady counties. We foster intergovernmental cooperation, communicating, collaborating, and facilitating regional initiatives. And we work with partners to help them address regional problems. And we established this webinar series to help planners sharpen their skills and as a vehicle for a planning board and zoning board of appeals members to obtain their necessary credit hours. Planning Board and Zoning Board of Appeals members are required by state statute to obtain four hours of training per year, and municipalities have a wide latitude in defining what training is acceptable for credit. After each webinar in the series, each attendee that registered with an email address will receive an automatic meet email confirming their attendance in this session, and that email may be submitted to your municipality for consideration of credit. If you called in, uh, send me an email. Um, at cdrpc at cdrpc.org and we'll see what we can do to furnish you with a certificate confirming your attendance. For practicing AICP planners, we have submitted this session for one hour of CM credit to the APA. Our attendees join with video and audio off for security purposes, but we have a large audience and we hope you still engage with us in a spirited dialogue. We will unmute uh, attendees and allow them to ask questions directly. Just let me know that you're interested in asking a question. I'll function like a radio DJ on a sports call and show. If you have a question, let me know. You can also just ask your question anonymously in the chat box and I'll make sure to pick my spots uh, and ask our uh, talented presenters today when I see an opportunity to, to break in. Presentation material will be archived as a PDF that will be available on the same website used to register for the webinar, the, um, the Eventbrite webinar uh, website. And the session is being recorded. Uh, recordings of our sessions will be posted on CDRPC's YouTube channel, and that will be available at the conclusion of the webinar series. Whew, all right, now we got all the housekeeping out of the way. Let's get to our presentation. Uh, today's presentation is Review Board Procedures, the who, what, and how to achieve development success. A comprehensive overview for municipal review board staff and elected officials and the general public outlining the roles, procedures, and most importantly, parameters of influence on typical development review applications. We'll keep attendees awake and engaged, and this session will utilize interactive tools. Check the chat box for links to those. Um, and we'll challenge your understanding of your role and uh, how you can reinforce best practices. We'll work through some sample applications to demonstrate how to leverage review processes, and we'll uh, eventually work to avoid the bad decisions and achieve your community's future development visions. Uh, topics will include New York State law requirements, site plans, special permits, variances, rezonings, and the significance of local plans and codes and guiding procedures. We have a very full and engaging presentation today. So with that, I want to welcome John and Molly for joining us. You're both muted. I, I muted you myself, so you may want to just unmute. Um, but we do want to hear you, and I'm looking forward to the next hour's presentation. So with that, I'll turn it over to uh, John and Molly. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Um, so hopefully everybody can see the screen here. Um, and just a quick note, um, we will be using, if you haven't seen the chat, we will be using um, some polling throughout. Um, so, you know, there's some connection information in that chat uh, box. And that way, um, you know, if you get disconnected or you need to come back to this information, um, you can do so. And there's also um, this QR code here that makes that an, an easier connection um, if that's uh, better for you to do it through your phone. Oops. All right, so we're gonna... if Oh, sorry, oh. Molly. If you're not able to log on, don't worry. Um, it's not gonna be a prerequisite to get something out of this presentation. We just thought it'd be a little more engaging for those of you who are interested and able to log on and take the polls. Mm -hmm. All right, here we go. Go ahead. 
All right, thank you, Molly. Um, again, my name is John Steinmetz. Thanks for joining us today. We really appreciate it. A uh, little background on myself and then Molly can introduce herself a little bit further. I've got 25 plus years as a professional planner throughout the state. Uh, six of those 25 years were for the city of Rochester. So I, I wore that municipal hat as a staff zoning and planner for the city of Rochester. And I also served as chairman of my uh, local planning board. So for those volunteer officials that are on the, uh, the, the call, the Zoom today, uh, you know, I've, I've sat where you're sitting currently uh, in terms of the decisions that you're faced with day to day as a volunteer board member, in addition to being a consultant that drafts codes and plans. And I'll just add ditto to that, only a little less experience, not quite 25 years, although I would have loved to have been a planner under the age of 10, I suppose. <laughs> um, but uh, So same thing. And um, the one thing I will say, this topic um, itself is something that I feel very passionate about because um, development review and your land use regulations are really the number one way that change is made in the character of your community, investment is made, growth is facilitated. Um, so this is something that I'm, I'm very passionate about and trying to help uh, municipal leaders, review board members, community leaders work with the tools that they have and help develop good tools um, to achieve your vision. Just a little bit about Barton and Judas and about our practice, just to give you an idea, not necessarily, this is not meant to be an infomercial or a plug, but more about our experience. So if you have a question that um, comes to you during the presentation and say, geez, if you or Molly encountered this problem or this opportunity before, um, please share it. Um, you know, Barton and Judas is a full service engineering uh, firm. We do a landscape architecture planning uh, across the state and in the Northeast. But more importantly for this conversation is our planning uh, expertise. Our, our staff currently consists of seven certified planners. Our staff, our current staffs have worked on over 50 comprehensive and long range planning efforts, over 40 land use and code uh, updates or uh, regulatory amendments. Of those 90 projects, about 13 or 14 have been joint town village, town town type projects. And we've, we've honestly lost track of our public meetings and workshops, you know, we're in the hundreds. Um, so in terms of our planning and zoning experience, that's kind of the, the, the depth and breadth of what we do on a daily basis. So we're gonna start off, we just wanna kind of get an understanding of, of who's in uh, the Zoom, so to speak. So if you could take a second um, to use that polling tool and kind of let us know, um, you know, who's here, and that can help us hopefully gear some of our conversation to your roles um, and the potential issues and opportunities you face. Elected official. Awesome. So hopefully we got a, a few more, this is a good opportunity for us to kind of get a, an idea of who's connected. Um, again, you don't have to participate, but it, it does help us um, as we kind of get engaged through some of the examples and things that um, we go through. So interesting that we don't have any planning board or, or commission members or zoning board of appeals members um, on this session. All right. Um, so our, our second question for you, and again, if you aren't in the chat yet, you can uh, join at any time. That information at the top um, is also repeated. Uh, so how you can get uh, connected. Um, it looks like we got a pretty even split here. Oh, we do have someone from his EBA. Awesome. Good. Oh, that changed. <laughs> And then Molly, we had a question from Patricia. Can, can we do an online poll for those of us just watching on Zoom? I don't know how we would do that. Um, yeah, I mean, if you have your phone, you can text. Um, so, you know, and so you have your Zoom up. You don't have to do it from your computer. You can do it from your phone um, if that's easier for you to just text. Um, or you can, you know, if you have two windows or something like that. Um, okay, awesome. All right, so um, moving forward, and, and we do have a lot, that this is a, a training that John and I have done a, 
couple different ways. And it's usually about a two hour training. So we tried to cut that down um, to make it fit into the, the hour that we have for you today. So um, we might be going a little faster things. You'll notice we might be um, glossing over some of the minute details um, of this, but ultimately our goals today are to help you understand more about your role, your powers, and most importantly, your parameters of influence um, and having you feel comfortable with the tools that you have to get the results you want for your community, whether you are leading from as an elected official or a review board member, or I did see we had some, some staff members um, on as well. So the way, go ahead. Thank you, Molly. Uh, one thing that I wanted to start by saying is that we understand kind of uh, from our own personal experience, but also just working with a lot of planning and zoning officials, we understand kind of the motivation that most people get on these review boards to improve their community, to enhance the place that they care about. Um, and we think that process uh, starts with some kind of planning and visioning. Uh, so, you know, whether it's some of the examples of our planning products here, whether it's a comprehensive plan for a historic village that wants to preserve its, its historic uh, neighborhood character, or a plan for, for example, the town of Greece, which is a retail center for the Rochester area that's, you know, losing retail and bricks and mortar retail like other places across the state and across the country are, uh, you know, addressing some of these challenges that are facing communities or uh, trying to enhance what you've got. You know, the, this last page, two page spread is from a village waterfront and downtown revitalization plan. Um, so planning is paramount. Um, you know, I'm not just saying that as a professional planner, but that's the beginning. It kind of lays out the framework, it lays out the values for your community. So um, if you don't have some kind of conference of planning document or a series of documents that are current, that's, that's a really good place to start, to articulate your vision and then um, put that vision on paper and then start to plug away with it, plug away at it, I should say, to implement it. So you have your planning efforts. And what we're going to focus on today is the orange box and the light orange box in the lower right-hand corners, the implementation. So we want to make sure that your plans are then um, your then you have your codes updated to align with your plans, and then the hard part and the, the non glamorous work begins of administration and implementation of those codes. So one thing that John said, and I think some communities either aren't aware of this or we lose sight of it, um, you know, with a lot of the things that you have going on. Um, but like John said, the, the planning is the first step, and actually by New York State law. All communities who have a comprehensive plan or other guiding document are required to have their land use regulations, most frequently zoning, but not always, um, their land use and development regulations be in accordance with the direction of that plan. And we see it frequently where, you know, the reaction in codes is it, it's reactionary. Um, so to be, you know, the idea is to be more proactive, if you update your plan to make sure your codes reflect that. Um, and, and that applies to what we consider, you know, an important nuance of regulation and whether it's your zoning or land use law or something else, there's a spectrum of control, um, right? You know, this far left example here is um, Houston and you can see, you know, there's a lot going on, a lot of different heights, a lot of different uses, um, a lot of different characters, things like that. There's, there's literally no zoning there, no, uh, very little regulation. Some communities choose to be in the middle, maybe it's uses, maybe there's a little design, other pieces. Um, and then there's also a lot of communities, you know, think about historic preservation or very, you know, detailed design standards, um, maybe using more uh, technical code tools, like form-based code elements, things like that. The idea to think about this whole, through this whole process and looking at your vision and your plans is how much influence do you have and how much do you want? Um, how, how, you know, much do you want to direct development? How much do you want to expect from investment and development? Sorry, I'm just responding to Wayne in the chat. Um, so one of the things we want to do with the next polling feature is kind of get your preferences a little bit. This is an exercise that we do through most of our planning processes and our code processes. And every visual survey that you're going to get a taste of in a minute is, is tailored to the project and tailored to the community. So a visual survey for a village would be very different than uh, a city, which would be remarkably different from a rural community, for example. But we just want to get your uh, thoughts going a little bit and your wheels turning on preferences. Uh, so when you look at these pairs of images, we want you to look at the building scale location, the landscaping, the screening, and we just kind of want to get your thoughts on uh, various types of development 
and you know what that and how that character might impact your community's potential. So the first pairing is multifamily residential. So these are both uh, apartment complexes. The one on the left uh, is don't don't rate the snow. I apologize for the win winter image. We should get a new image because nobody likes tends to like the snow in this picture. We've heard that before, but if, if you were presented with the development on the left or the development on the right in your community, would you have a preference as a board member? Would you say, you know what, I think our community would be more enhanced by either A or B. Uh, you're also allowed not to have an opinion. Maybe you, you really don't care about preference and you just want uh, you know, the option of multifamily living in your community, but we just want to gauge to see if people have a preference over these two types of development. Characters. Just to give a little context to why these show, we showed these images is a lot of communities we are hearing are seeing more interest in multifamily development or mixed density and both of these are kind of a mid ground showing anywhere from two to uh, five or six units in a building. So with results coming in, a lot of bees. <laughs> And then we've got one, one attendee who's not taking a poll, but, she, but uh, commented either is okay as long as they are owner occupied. Yeah, uh, I, he, he is in the poll, but yes. And that's an, an interesting point and something we can discuss later, or maybe if you wanna talk about it further in the, the Q and A, but um, you know, that's something zoning or your regulations can't do is regulate whether something's owner occupied or renter. So um, really, you know, this is focused on the character and the, the types of uses or densities or maybe housing needs um, for your community and how you can make it best fit in the context of your community. So our second of three pairings, and now we're moving on to commercial. Uh, so this is, you know, franchise restaurants. You've got a McDonald's on the left and you've got uh, Dairy Queen on the right. And then the building beyond the Dairy Queen, I think is an AT&T uh, mobile store. Um, so again, if this were your town, village, city, commercial corridor district, uh, and you were presented with, you know, the McDonald's site building placement, site architecture on the left or the Dairy Queen on the right, would you have a preference? And if so, what is it? If you don't have a preference, that's okay too. I think this is the first time it's at, we've done this and it's been pretty much a hundred percent. There's always a few stray, of, um, but this is good. All right, and last one. Uh, mixing of uses. So the image on the left is a horizontal mixing of uses where you have a retail plaza and a, a US postal office uh, on the site, uh, set back from the streets, single story uh, buildings, as opposed to the mixed use structure on the right, which has retail on the first floor and then apartments on the upper two floors. So vertical mixing of uses on the right, horizontal mixing of uses on the left. Um, and then do you, have an, a pref, do you have a preference on how they are presented uh, to the community in these two images? And, and just to give a little bit of context to this too, um, both of these developments are infill that happened within more of a traditional main street, like a village main street setting. Um, so just thinking about that character and that context, if that influences your choice. And then I think Wayne said A, so we have one. Mm -hmm. And then mostly Bs. So what I can draw from those three responses, uh, again, nothing incredibly scientific. Normally we'd have an active dialogue about it, but the three images that scored the highest, um, those all had some similar themes. Uh, they were more up to the street, the, the parking was screened or behind the building, the buildings had, um, more of a street presence and created more of a walkable environment, a little more significant architectural presence. Um, so there are some themes between the good images, whereas the images that people tended to avoid were uh, pavement heavy, pavement forward type image, images, whether it's driveways, parking lots, et cetera, uh, little to no landscaping and the architectural quality of those buildings are, are, are I'm gonna be kind, were less than the other higher scoring images. And just to finalize that point and kind of preface where we're going in this next section, um, you know, how those connect to your plans and codes, um, you can 
establish saying those preferences as part of your plans. It's a lot of things we work through when we work with communities on their plan updates, setting a vision for um, community character, things like that. You know, you don't have to dictate an architectural style, so to speak, but if your code doesn't back that up, um, then you potentially could still be leaving the door open for the left versus something um, on the right. You need to be a little more explicit. So it, with that in mind, um, you know, your level of influence, we're going to walk through a few examples of applications and, um, you know, talk about ways that you can shape them. Um, obviously, you play an important role in the process for all of these, but, you know, it's important to note that there is an opportunity in cases for communities to mismanage uh, review procedures. Maybe it's overly complex. Maybe there's a lot of um, contra or conflict of um, boards or things like that um, that can end up hindering investment. Um, you know, we all, you know, maybe there's a community that doesn't have a great uh, reputation when it comes to developers or applicants coming in and going before certain boards. So, you know, how can you maybe be open the door or be a little bit more friendly um, while still getting what you want? Your decisions also can help to protect the character and quality of life, but there obviously have the alternative um, consequence where there could be some detrimental actions. And a lot of things when you're thinking about development, it's a building that's probably gonna be there for 20, 30, 40, 50 plus years. What does that mean um, for your long range vision? And the, you know, the good news is some of you can affect this change above and beyond what your code says. Um, and some of you obviously are more limited. So typically the discretionary boards um, are things like your legislative body, town board, village board, um, and planning board. Whereas the ones that are really narrowed by law under their powers are the zoning board of appeals and obviously code enforcement officials. Um, I should have put planning staff and dev economic development staff on the left side too, but so. Uh, jumping in to our first uh, application example variances, um, I think a lot of people are, are aware of these. Um, we kind of going to use this to, to set the tone and pace for how we walk through these. Um, so the who for this, it's, it's Zoning Board of Appeals and it cannot be anybody else. Um, so if you have a zoning code um, or a land use regulations, you have to have a Board of Appeals and that is the only board that can issue or address appeals and variances. Um, I, I haven't seen anybody do that contrary yet, but um, you never know. So um, your triggers, obviously it's technically an appeal. It's something that your code enforcement um, or you know, administrative staff says, you don't meet our code requirements. Um, it's a reality for all types of codes that you have. So, you know, there's a huge rise for form-based elements or form-based codes in New York State, but even those can be challenged with variances. And sometimes, you know, zoning is particularly rigid sometimes can't be very context sensitive and there are cases where you may um, run into variances, um, but obviously the idea is to not <laughs> need that. Um, if, you, if you're issuing a lot of variances, there's probably an issue in your, in your code. Um, so that's a big red flag. Uh, the two types of variances, I'm sure you're you know, aware of these as well, are area and use. Um, you could go in New York State law, find the definitions, but we boiled it down here. If I'm asking for an area variance, that means that the physical conditions of my property um, are preventing me from meeting the code requirements. Uh, whereas if it's a use variance, you're asking to do something that the code doesn't allow. And the statement of you not allowing it is saying you probably generally really don't want it. It's gonna need to be a very exceptional situation. New York State intends the use variance to be the most difficult one to get. Um, so again, if you're issuing a lot of use variances, that's also something that you probably wanna visit. We, we've got a couple of examples that we want to get your thoughts on uh, just to reinforce the use and area variances concepts uh, if you're if you're not as familiar with them as Molly said an area variance tends to be related to the physical limitations of a person's property or their chosen use of said property so this example we have in this photograph is a single family home it's zoned for single family uses and in this particular example the owners are having triplets and they want to put an addition on their home. So the yellow box shows the new addition going into the front setback and into the side setback uh, as required by law. So this would require not one, but two area variances as we drew it. So your review criteria, um, this is the variances are the one uh, case where you have no variation or potential to either add or remove from this list. Um, so all applications have to be held to these standards. Um, you know, are you going to cause an undesirable change? Are you creating an adverse impact uh, in, in any way? 
Is it a substantial request? Is it something that could be minimized or reduced? Um, you know, what, what level of that impact is it? Uh, is that difficulty that you're, you've had on your property self-created? And is it uh, something that could be, you know, uh, granting this could be the benefit achieved in a different way? Um, are really your, your standards taking a look at those. So thinking about that, thinking about the example that John just gave of that potential addition, really pushing the front and side setbacks, um, we kind of just want to ask you the question, a little test, which one is a question that the zoning board can ask of an area variance applicant like the one we saw previously? And Molly, once this is done, go back to that arrow photo once this poll is, once we talk about this. I, I, think, I think it is done, which is great. Yeah. <laughs> and, and that's... Um, Good crowd. Yeah, that, that is a, an uh, allowed, oops, excuse me, allowed question. Um, yeah, Glenn had a question about self-created hardship. And, and I picked this example for a reason, because I, I think, in my opinion, it'd be very easy, given the, back, the amount of backyard this property has and the amount of side yard it has, to slide that addition to the back. Uh, so, so maybe you don't need a front yard variance, maybe you only need a side yard variance. Or you could also, there's enough property, in my opinion, to do that same addition oriented in a different way where it would need any variances. Um, so this is clearly a self-created hardship. Um, given the size of the lot and what other opportunities there are on this property for that same exact addition. And I, just from serving on a board of zoning appeals myself, almost all applications you're going to get, it's the applicant coming in because they've made a decision to modify their property. It's very rarely going to be a non-self-created hardship. There are some circumstances where you may have a medical service provider that is being required to update their facility per New York State Department of Health guidelines or other types of state or federal mandates on types of development that force them to make a modification to their property. But almost always, it's an issue of them making a choice to make a modification to a sign or a deck or a building in order to trigger that. But you're right. These are almost all self-created hardships, and those, those are not dispositive. So our, our second example, use variance. So same property. And if, if you're an aerial photography geek like I am, um, you might notice there's a cemetery across the street. So in this hypothetical example, same property, same residential zoning, same single family current use. And the, the owner has always wanted to open a flower shop and they live across from a cemetery. So they thought, what an ideal place for a flower shop. Uh, when someone goes visits their loved one in the cemetery, they could stop by my place and buy some flowers and then go to the graveyard. So this person wants to convert their home to a flower shop, 100% retail. So no more, no more residential, all commercial uh, flower shop operation in a, in a single family district. Uh, this is what uh, this owner would like consideration of. And so again, this, these are your review criteria. These four are set by New York State law. And one of the things that's different about this one is um, it, it's on the applicant to prove that all of these apply. So again, this is the hardest standard to meet. You, you have to be able to answer for all of these. Either you're restricted, you can't realize a reasonable return under any other permitted use. Um, and you have to demonstrate that financially. The hardship is not self-created. Again, uh, it will not alter the character and um, it's unique and does not apply to a substantial portion of the district or neighborhood. So again, that's that contextual piece that codes obviously can't foresee or really react to well. So uh, thinking about those, this question's uh, flipped. Which question is not a question that you can ask of the flower shop uh, applicant and converting that home? Yeah, good. So spoiler alert, that is the answer. It looks like we've got a, an A plus class today. Um, so this, this is great. 
All right. So the, the moral of the story here um, and the factors of your decision, and this is a big one to think about, um, is you want to think about and making sure you're granting the minimum variance necessary. So first example, that addition, you know, maybe it's you, they can move it and meet the front setback, but they are constrained on that side setback. That's the reality. You can't reduce that, you know, in, in any way. Um, so maybe that's one of the things. You can also impose conditions um, on your uh, reviews. So, you know, Moral of, of a lot of our applications we go through, you don't always have to accept what comes in the door. You can negotiate and you can apply conditions that are gonna help mitigate some of your concerns. A uh, big thing to think about with variances is, is this is a, pr a permanent approval. It does not become non-conforming, even if you update your code. Um, the only thing that would change is if it magically became conforming by your code. Um, and it cannot be revoked. This is a permanent approval for the property. Um, so again, this is like, if, there, if there's any other way to do it, you really want to pursue that rather than a variance. So special use permits. Uh, similarly, this is something, um, you know, that we see commonly with the Zoning Board of Appeals, um, but we do also see it as a planning board uh, power and uh, less frequently, but we have seen it as the Municipal Board or Legislative Board um, also becomes uh, potentially the final decision on special use permits. Um, our, in our opinion, planning board is typically best practice if they also control site plan, which we can touch on. That's another nuance of a lot of times you have a special permit and a site plan application, and that becomes another complex um, procedure. But, you know, we really recommend that the same board look at those so that you're reducing the potential for conflicting decisions, issuing of one approval, not the other, what are the implications there. We do know of a few municipalities have run into legal trouble as a result of that. Um, but just, you know, there's no wrong way. Um, you can really give this power to anyone. It just has to be explicit. Your triggers, obviously in your code, it's what you know as a special use permit, and you want to make sure that's clearly identified. Um, so this is an example. Um, we're a big fan of cleaning up codes and making them uh, very user friendly. So this is something we're working on with City of Geneva, and you can see anything in their residential districts under a residential type use here that's specially permitted is denoted with an SP. So it's very clear to someone to look to see across all the districts what types of dwellings are permitted and what are specially permitted. So the example in this case, there's an empty lot in a C2 district. C2 is a, a commercial district that allows uh, fast food restaurants and uh, things of that nature. And one oh, of right here. and then uh, one of the specially permitted uses in this district is an auto body repair shop. So in, I'd like to uh, purchase this empty lot and place an auto body repair establishment on it. And to give you a little context, uh, here is what the street currently looks like. Uh, in the upper image, that's the existing conditions today. So as you can see, a uh, majority of that street residential character is residential in character, uh, sing single family homes. And my proposal is the lower image. So um, I'm looking the red, the red structure. That's what I want to put there. I want to put the parking in front. I want the building in the back. I want, I'll put a privacy fence along my uh, right hand neighbor's property uh, to screen their property. I'll do that for them because I'm a nice guy. Uh, and I would like consideration of this auto repair body shop in that location, uh, please. So thinking about your review criteria, um, just you know, as a note, you wanna make sure these are explicitly stated in your code because unlike the variances, these are not dictated by New York state law. Um, so the types of things that you want to consider as part of special use permits um, can be you know, very simple in what you're, stating and looking at, um, or can be pretty extensive. Um, so, you know, anything that related, how is it consistent with your adaptive plans and studies? Is it actually code compliant? Um, is it affecting neighborhood character? Or is it consistent with it? What's the intensity of use? Is it gonna be too, too many cars, too much traffic, uh, excessive lighting, noise? Um, how are you providing for landscaping and screening? What types of services and utilities are gonna be needed? Are they adequate? what needs to be provided. Overall, the, the answer really there boils down to how does this protect or impact the general public health, safety, and welfare? So this question, again, about a special use permit, the example that John gave of that auto body shop on that um, parcel but in the neighborhood, but adjacent to a commercial uh, area, 
which question is not a question that you could ask of the applicant um, in reviewing their request for an auto body shop on that parcel. Okay, so we're, we're getting, we're splitting a little bit. Mm -hmm. Oh. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so keeping consistent with our with the uh, a, a plus status, um, that is the, the correct answer. Um, you know, you can ask all about the, the character or the level of impact of the use, but you one big thing we see with variances and special use permits is it's not about John being a nice guy. John might be great, but you've got to consider the site, the context. It's, it's not about the person. You know, um, John might be great, but if he sells it to me, and you know, maybe I'm not as considerate of my neighbors. I'm just out to make the buck. Um, so that's one of the things that you know you want to make sure that you're limiting your review to. So we're just curious, um, you know, given that example, that that uh, potential auto body on that parcel, um, what would you? How would you decide um, and and answer that? And like Jen said before, we'd love to have a discussion about this. Um, but you know, we we do want to make sure we can get through everything. So if we have time, maybe we can come back to it. Okay. Molly, we're doing good on time with this particular topic. So I'm gonna um, throw you an easy curveball uh, for you to hit. Can you talk briefly about the difference between a conditional use permit that some communities may have in their code versus a special use permit that New York State law talks about? Yeah, so um, conditional use or another term we see special exception uses um, are really just outdated terms, so to speak, for um, a special use, especially permitted use. Um, so New York State, we really recommend using New York State's nomenclature. So using special uh, use permit or specially permitted use. Um, and the reason for that is, is because there's a different implication. So a conditional use kind of says, yeah, we'll allow it as long as it meets certain conditions of ours, um, right? So you're kind of setting this, setting the, statement that you're already in an approval state of mind. Um, same thing, maybe special exception use is like, all oh, right, you know, this, this is the exception to the rule, right? Which um, in my opinion is maybe a little bit more, um, the exception would be a, a variance realm. Um, but specially, special permitted use, that is really the context of the area. It's, it's the one place in the code that you can start to be really contextually sensitive to, um, you know, the, the area, like one of the reasons why I like the example we just showed is it is um, a parcel that actually abuts a, a much more commercial development pattern. So you could have access there, um, even though there are a few houses in between there. So you know, we see that some of you said approve of conditions and maybe that's why, right? It's, it's a potential to stay connected to that commercial district area, but you want certain criteria met. Um, so this, again, it's, it's something where you have the opportunity to negotiate mitigating measures um, and put on limitations. And this includes um, time limitations uh, and you can require renewal. So, you know, in, in the event that you wanna allow that auto body potentially, but we're gonna say, you know what, we, we really wanna see how this is gonna work out potentially. So we're gonna give you three years and, you know, if we come back and we hear that this is just really impacted the neighbors in a negative way, or it's just not appropriate, then, you know, you can require uh, essentially a renewal of that and deny it for whatever reason. Um, and you want to make sure that your, any conditions or parameters um, that you have on your uh, approval are in the written decision. Um, don't just say we approve it with conditions and talk about it with the applicant at the meeting and call it a day. Um, you want to make sure there's a record of that. For example, if in John's request for that auto body shop, he says, I'm going to have two bays to do work. And two years down the road, he wants, he adds two more. If you did not explicitly speak to the extent of the use at that time, arguably you could say he does not need the issuance of a new special use permit. So even though those two more bays double the intensity of the use. So you want to be context sensitive to that and make sure you have the ability to say, whoa, 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 two was cool, four is not. If that's what you wanna do, you gotta find a different site in a much more appropriate commercial area. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah. When we talk about recording those decisions, um, 
Is are there circumstances where, or is it a best practice to? I'm, I'm a completely foreign, con, not a foreign concept, but but wondering, um, does the planning board have the require have the ability to require the applicant to um, put an an addendum or file something with the deed for that particular property, so the next person who buys it sees that as a de facto that there is a conditional use tied to it. Yeah, so um, that is something, so special use permits by default, and, and we've heard some different opinions on this, but by default, run with the land. Mm -hmm. um, so it's not that you issued John the approval, it's that property, right? Um, so, you know, that is something that um, any, any t as it changes over time uh, with a new owner, things, it's still applicable. But I see in the chat, there's a, a question, do they expire? And the answer is that it depends on what your code says. Um, but for example, we have a, see a lot of codes that say if that special use ceased operation for six consecutive months, 12 consecutive months, whatever, whatever your time frame is, then that essentially can revoke that, that permit. And so if somebody wanted to come in and establish the new use or that use again, even if it's the same thing, you'd require the issuance of a new one. So that gives you a little bit of an opportunity to, again, if, if there's a change in character or use that you wanna see, making sure that you're not stuck with that decision over time, like as it, as it says on that last bullet there, a use variance is permanent. The special use permit doesn't have to be permanent. You can set it however um, you'd like that, uh, the parameters of that to be. So that's, that's a, you know, this can be a very good tool it requires a lot of nuance. Um, and all I can say is really that the more context and tools, explicit tools you have in your code um, to help you in reviewing it and determining intensity of use, the better off you're gonna be. And obviously if anyone's violating their, their approval then they lose their permit as well. All right, all right let's talk site plan review. Uh, I think site plan review is pretty exciting uh, because I think it's one of the more powerful tools in the sense that you can, you can actually shape uses more than some of the other tools. Um, you can shape the, the layout of the site, potentially the, the character of the building, depending on how your code is written. And who does this varies, just like some of the other ones we've talked about. Uh, but I think this one probably varies uh, as widely as any of the other practices. So we've seen site plan review under the purview of uh, planning boards. And I think that would be the most common and probably the best practice for most places without uh, a robust planning staff. For example, if you're all volunteer planning board, zoning board, uh, elected officials, for example, having site plan review with your planning board often makes the most sense. We have seen elected officials do this on occasion. And it's one of the um, few powers uh, delegated by New York State that does not require a public hearing and does not require a public process. So this can be an internal process. Um, so, uh, when I ran the site plan review process for the city of Rochester, the city of Rochester has an internal only process uh, to their site plan review um, decisions and considerations. And the other thing I really like about site plan review is the triggers can be custom made to each community where the zoning variance criteria that Molly talked about for area variances and use variances, they're dictated by New York State. There's no gray area there. You can essentially custom build your trigger list. What requires site plan review in your town, in your village, in your city is completely up to you. Uh, and you've got a, an example, we just threw a table here that we are uh, put together for the village of Virgin that has kind of a consumer reports kind of approach to it. So, you know, if I'm doing this type of action, do I, am I an exempt? Am I exempt from site plan review? Do I need minor site plan review or major site plan review? So you can really tailor this to your particular situation. Looking at a couple of examples of site plan review, we're gonna look at one site two different ways. So again, site plan review gets, gets triggered when you're making a physical investment to the external features of your property, you're changing something. In this particular example, you've got a, a couple of parcels in the Northwest quadrant of this intersection of two major streets. And I'd like to convert this current use to um, a coffee shop with a drive-through. I wanna put a Dunkin' Donuts here. 
uh, Dunkin' Donuts is excited about the location and the market. And according to this particular code, I need site plan review because I'm uh, a restaurant and eating establishment and I'm, in, and I'm doing new construction. So I have two site plan triggers uh, on this particular property. So let's talk about how site plan review could unfold. So proposal one, uh, again, this example is a built example on our Northwest Quadrant adjacent to two major streets. So it's an apples to apples comparison to what you just saw. And I'd like to use this type of development. I'd like to build this type of Dunkin' Donuts um, for your consideration. So we have the building to push to the left or to the west, parking along the street, the drive-through is behind the building. And there's really not a lot, enough room for landscaping. So we've got a green strip, but I'd like to put trees there, but there's just not enough room. Uh, so this is my proposal to you uh, for this current Dunkin' Donuts. Site plan review criteria is also up to local uh, codes and considerations. So you can put the criteria that you think makes sense. There are a lot of similar criteria from code to code to code. Uh, obviously you need to meet other code requirements to the extent you can. You want to reference other planning documents, whether it's a conference of plan or maybe it's a site uh, plan review in, along the water. So we have a local waterfront revitalization program to consider. So consider and incorporate your other planning documents in the review criteria. And then you can look at things like drainage and infrastructure, motor vehicle circulation and access and parking, pedestrian and bike circulation, landscaping screening, and then some codes are written, and we think some of the better codes are written to address building design, location, et cetera. So all of these things are two potential considerations for your boards. So if you recall that uh, scenario A, how would you find that Dunkin' Donuts that was pushed to the west, drive-through was around the back, parking was up to the street, um, how would you decide on that one site plan application? Would you approve it? Would you approve it with modifications or deny the site plan application for scenario A? Oops, I think I, there we go. Wait a ah. There we go. Okay. Okay. So most people would approve it with modifications and a handful would, would say deny. Got it. Thank you. Um, so Morgan's got a question in the chat and it's actually, um, Morgan, we'll get to that in, in one second. So scenario B, again, Northwest quadrant of an intersection of two major streets, also a Dunkin' Donuts. Uh, for this particular scenario, I'm proposing a Dunkin' Donuts to the drive through but in this case, I've got the building up to the corner. The drive through will loop around behind the building and the parking is gonna to be to the north. Uh, so you can see how we've got a nice outdoor seating area uh, with some brick piers, some fencing, uh, some awnings, a little, need a little more architectural treatments to the building. The building's in a completely different location. Uh, but again, same circumstances as the prior scenario. I'm asking you to consider this site plan review application. How would you decide? Okay. All right. Um, again, we don't have an ability to be able to chat, but I think based on the CPS, the community preference survey results you said earlier and the reactions to some of those, it seemed like the location of the building, the screening, the parking lot, the architectural treatment of the building, all may have contributed to um, your thinking in that process uh, and decision making for that site, site plan A versus site plan B. So when you get into site plan review and making sure your code is up to snuff, think about uh, what you want. I mean, when you talk about landscaping, does your code require landscaping? You look at the image in the upper left, uh, there's no landscaping on that particular site. The image in the middle, there's grass, but there's no trees, no bushes, no real screening, just more of a setback with some grass in it. The lower left-hand Im image, you've got a, a robust landscaping environment, trees, shrubs, sidewalk, et cetera. So when you, when you talk about landscaping and screening, what level do you want? Uh, what does your code allow you to do? And then through site plan review, you can, you can often go a little bit beyond your code, but your code does need to at least lay the groundwork for that leveraging. You should also, can also think about uh, pedestrian connections, for example. In the upper left, the only pedestrian facility in that image is a sidewalk right next, right next to the building. Uh, the middle image, 
has got um, a sidewalk that connects from the public sidewalk through the grass into the parking lot and then through the parking lot is a striped designated pedestrian connection. And then the lower left image is the best we've seen in this particular target where you have a raised sidewalk going through the middle of the parking lot with landscaped islands, et cetera, to really provide a direct pedestrian connection to the building that is protected and comfortable. And I just want to add to, we frequently see parking requirements that are excessive in terms of either driveway, drive aisle widths or parking size widths and modifying your requirements to include something like this bottom left image it's very easy if you borrow from that excess of minimum space that, that you're asking for. You know, other things to look at in your code, when you talk about infill building and new architecture, does your code give you the tools um, through the design criteria and site plan review process? You need both, you need the criteria and the process to work together to get infill buildings like this, or if your code is silent on it, you may get an infill building that looks like that. Um, so you really want to make sure you code for what you get, you code for what you want, and then your site plan review process will help you achieve that and get those results. So to, to kind of get to your question, Morgan, um, you know, before that, the big piece here is that, you know, your, your code is what's going to hamstring you or what's going to help you. Um, so clearly there was a, a preference for site plan B that we showed, um, but under this community's particular zoning, uh, regulations, the site plan A is the what's code compliant and site plan B would require, um, I, I think several variances uh, in terms of setbacks and all these other elements. And if I'm, you know, the, the applicant coming in, I don't want to have to add the next 30, 60 months, another review board meeting, uh, more, you know, costs in terms of application materials, all of these things. So you want to make sure you're creating the path of least resistance and you are actually um, supporting the character and development that you want, um, like you see in the, the example on the left rather than the example on the right. Um, to Morgan's question, say site plan A were the existing condition um, and that building itself, you know, already exists. Um, maybe it, it wasn't a coffee shop. Maybe it was something else, um, you know, a, a store. And now you're adding that um, uh, drive through or something like that. If it doesn't meet the setback requirements, it's technically considered pre-existing non-conforming in most cases, I would assume. Um, so as long as they're not increasing the level of non-conformity, um, so they weren't moving the building further back, for example, or um, further violating uh, another setback requirement, then you can, you can consider it under its existing conditions. So that's typically what your non-conforming section, regu section regulations say, is as long as you're not increasing its level of non-conformity, it's okay. The big thing is, again, like we said, if, it, if you're saying something's non-conforming, you're saying you don't want it. So you wanna make sure that, um, you know, that using that is how you nudge stuff in the direction that you want to see it go. Molly and John, when you talk about um, increasing nonconformity, are you familiar with, or do you have any examples of communities that look at intensity of use as to whether that qualifies as increasing nonconforming? Because if I take this Dunkin' Donuts example and I add a drive-through, I am extraordinarily increasing intensity of use and exacerbating the non-conforming use. Um, I'm not uh, a land use attorney, but I would venture that, uh, I would argue that that would be something that might uh, trigger a uh, review by a uh, planning department. Yeah, ab absolutely. And, you know, that can come in a lot of different ways, whether it's adding to the um, actual operation of the use, like adding a drive through, or like I spoke before, you know, maybe it's a per uh, specially permitted auto repair shop, but now you're going to add um, uh, more bays. So you have more activity, potentially more customers, more noise, all that. Um, or between these two examples, too. Um, you know, I'm going from site plan A and I'm adding the number of parking that you see in site plan B, even that is an increase in intensity. And if the site itself were already non-conforming, adding that may, would be uh, something you wanna strongly consider and potentially, you know, again, not allow um, because of that. Yeah, the challenge, and ditto to what um, Martin and Molly just said, but one thing to keep in mind too, 
with increasing nonconformity. Sometimes there are certain uses or certain situations where you, you need to accommodate that and accept that. You know, you have white elephants, uh, old abandoned churches, for example. You know, you've got this beautiful structured church. Uh, doesn't have a lot of parking because it was in the neighborhood. Um, any use that you're going to propose there will likely increase the activity to from one service on a Sunday or one service on Saturday and one service on Sunday to something else. You know, one of my favorite places in Pittsburgh is the Church Brew Works. They turned an old, beautiful church into a brewery, restaurant, bar. Um, wonderful reuse, but clearly increase the intensity of that use. So, so sometimes you're forced with, is this church going to sit vacant forever and hope another church fills it? Or are we going to allow some increase of intensity and some non-traditional uses to revitalize the building, save the building, and et cetera? So, um, you know, it's, it's, it's nine times out of ten, more intensity can be problematic. But every once in a while, you got to think about those situations where more intensity might be necessary. Right. Yeah, and, 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 and again, you know, just a plug for the, those board of zoning appeals to work with an applicant to minimize the variance when you're looking at an intensity of use. Certainly, they can mitigate some of those things like hours of operation or delivery or, you know, location of a dumpster or some of the requirements that you're going to need variances for, but ultimately have to respond to community concerns about an intensity for a use that was never considered when the building was constructed. So, mm -hmm. Yes, and also one thing to think about too is just because, um, you know, again, if, if this um, setback were non-conforming, say you had a minimum setback requirement because you're wanting to start to get to what you're seeing on the right here, um, you know, but somebody wants to come in and do something with this property and make improvements, that's an opportunity to say, all right, we, you know, you're utilizing a property with a non-conforming building. We've upped our standards. Now we want to see landscaping and screening. We want you to make some kind of improvement in terms of landscaping. So it's, it's give and take. It's, you know, depending on the, the process that you're going through, if it's something that's uh, a variance piece or if it's a special permit or if it's just site plan, all of those negotiations have merit throughout the process and um, as part of that. Um, so amendments I'm gonna to touch on quickly because I, I do wanna make sure we have time maybe for a, a couple of questions. Um, so the amendment process, again, this is something that you have to provide for um, if you have a, a code or a land use law. Um, and essentially what this is is somebody has an idea or you notice something, uh, maybe it's a new development opportunity or investment opportunity, and the code doesn't allow it or maybe doesn't even speak to it at all, um, but it's something that you may wanna consider. It might be consistent with your, um, you know, your vision. Um, who can do this? Again, this is limited. Um, it's required to be a final decision by your municipal board or your legislative um, body. So it is a, a change in law. The, the legislative body has to do that. There are a lot of procedures um, that we see in communities where the planning board gets involved and makes um, you know, an advisory decision as part of that um, process as well. The triggers for this uh, come from a couple different places. It can be just as you know, planning board and day-to-day -day operations kind of see, you know what, this application's this type of application's come in front of us several times. Our code's not dealing with it well. We really need to, to change it. Send that on up the pipeline and, and recommend the legislative body to change it. The board can do that also on their own. Also can be done by petition of property owners. Um, the types of amendments that you see are text amendments, map amendments, and plan developments or planned unit developments. Um, those are the like full Monty of review because uh, they're, you know, their site plan, their subdivision, if you have subdivision, their use considerations, and obviously they ultimately result in, an, in a rezoning or an amendment. So, you know, that's a conversation for another day, but um, the two basic ones um, that you think about are text and map amendments. Um, the big thing here is to just defer to your planning documents um, and your studies and seeker. Uh, think about the context, the impacts environmentally, um, you know, in terms of your character and density, the implications of your decision when you're approving it, obviously you're saying, all right, this is going to rectify a disconnect we have between our vision and what our code's saying. Um, and when you say no, maybe it's that, you know, property owner or some developer who's like, you know what, I just, I want to go for this. And you're like, well, nope, you know, we didn't want that for a reason. So good try, but we're, <laughs> we're going to say no. Um, and the ultimate result of your approval here is an actual change um, or amendment, supplement, repeal, 
to your code or the district boundaries. So that looks like, um, as we, we've all seen in your codes, the notes of when things might've been added or um, keeping track of your disposition list and what changes. And in terms of map amendments, this is a community um, that you know, we're working with where we've seen at one point they did a zoning, uh, a rezoning and, you know, the district boundaries maybe, you know, weren't quite as nuanced. And as you see here, this section of this block is zoned um, commercial, actually relatively high intensity commercial, if you look at the other side of the block. But these are all, um, you know, pretty walkable, small scale residential units. Um, so you're potentially opening up the door for what's happening over here to happen smack dab in the middle of these homes or at the fringe and start to detract from that character. So we think that that's a kind of a no brainer, um, rec you know, way to rectify uh, what your code allows. It's, you know, maybe it was an oversight at the time um, or thoughts have changed. So wrapping it up. Uh, the deeper dive, like we said, there's a lot of elements to these procedures we did not touch on. Um, public hearings and how they fit into each of these process, uh, processes where they're required. Like John said, site plan review is really one of the only ones that doesn't require it by law, but your code may say it's required. Uh, seeker, big component of that. County referral kicks in in many occasions. A lot of communities overlook this. Don't overlook this. You cannot make a decision until you get your answer from the county. So don't take action until you hear from the county uh, planning board. Um, and then if you, you know, things like if you have an, a local waterfront revitalization program, you likely have a waterfront consistency uh, review law that requires that as a step as well. There's the additional procedures to consider like subdivisions if you have it, plan developments, cluster developments, incentive zoning, maybe you have historic preservation laws or you want more robust historic preservation consideration. So a whole host of land use and development tools out there that you can take a look at. So if you zoned out, um, if you, you know, kind of were in and out of here, um, you know, eating lunch as part of this, here's the high points. Make sure your uh, plans are updated and reflect what it is you wanna see in your community. It makes a huge difference and a legal challenge. If your plan doesn't say it, you're not likely to win. Um, ensure your code aligns with your plans and policies. Again, that's law. If you're not requiring it, no one's expected to do it. Um, so make sure that those two are in sync. Make sure you clearly define your triggers so your applicants know what's expected of them when they have to come in front of you and see you and what standards they're being held to in terms of their review criteria. Make sure your regulations are crafted in a way that support your minimum expectations, right? Think about those site plan examples that we gave before. If you do not want to see parking in front of a building, require that parking be to the side or to the rear. That way you have the teeth to make that negotiation and it's not um, you know, a back and forth battle. Reward the good projects, um, you know, potentially with maybe it's a streamlined process um, or, you know, getting things through the door a little quicker, um, you know, incentive zoning can do some of these things as well. And make sure you feel comfortable, you're okay to reject the bat. If they're not going to budge, if the applicant's not going to respond to the things that you'd like them to see um, within reason, you have every right to reject that. I think, you know, we see across upstate, um, uh, you know, New York that, there might be hesitancy because we want to see investment, but if somebody's coming forward with an, an, op, you know, an idea or investment, there's interest there. So you do have leverage. Don't feel like you just have to accept what comes through the door. And um, like I said before, there may be opportunities to streamline your process. Yeah, I know it's 202, so we're, we're done. I just wanted one thank you for joining us. And if there's questions, by all means, let's engage in the conversation. And you know, Molly and I are passionate about planning and code work. Uh, if, if, you, if anything has struck your fancy on this conversation, you want to talk more, please reach out to us. Here's our contact information. Uh, we're a fan of doing code audits for, for clients and communities. Um, so if you want us to take a look at your code and have a conversation specific to your community, call us. We'll be happy to do that. Um, you know, so with that, I'll shut up and turn it back to our moderator and see if there's any other questions or comments. Yeah, you guys were great responding to questions people are throwing in the chat. It makes my job really easy. Um, but if folks have any questions, uh, type them in the chat box or, you know, ask in the Q&A. I think we did a really comprehensive review of a lot of material. I will definitely um, call you guys up next time we do a series because there's a lot more material. Maybe we can extend this by a little bit and not have to feel like you're burdened with, with uh, cramming everything in. Um, we had, did have a question. Oh, I just minimized it. 
Um, and just a, just a, a compliments from Morgan. This is really helpful as a new volunteer planning board member at a small village. We struggle with getting businesses in, making them update the sites to meet code because it's expensive. I think that points out something that's also, you know, not only are you um, providing some element of a pressure valve between development and, and the community expectations, you're also making the rules much more legible for businesses. Um, you know, I hear oftentimes regulations are anti-development, but that's not the case. What's traditionally anti-development is confusion and delay. And so a developer is not going to invest putting together a site plan when you yourselves don't know how you may be reviewing it or how the rules are going to apply. Uh, other symptoms of if there's only one developer in town or only one attorney that represents clients in town, you've got a problem because they're the only ones who understand the rules of the game. So I think clear code is, is and, and, and to some degree, um, design guidelines can be very helpful in encouraging development because everybody knows the rules before they start the game. So um, I think that's important to mention. Design guidelines don't have to mean historic. We want to see Tudor style Italian. Absolutely. It doesn't have to be that. You can have very basic, we've made design guidelines for very rural communities um, that they just wanted, you know, they expected something a little bit more than that brick box. Um, yeah, if they're. Wayne has his hand raised. I don't oh. know. Uh, Wayne, did you want to ask a question or you can type it into the chat box? We'll refer to it. Unmute him, maybe. Yeah, let's know if see. I can do that. Uh, give me just a moment. Oh, um, we have, do have a question while we're figuring out what if Wayne wants to ask a question. Seems like he's good. All right. Um, we had a question from Elizabeth Cormos. Are design standards better than guidelines? It's a great yes. I, I say yes. <laughs> yes, um, if you actually want them to do it. Because yeah. if your code says should, at the end of the day, if they really don't want to do it, you, you really it's going to be very hard for you to say no on that basis alone. So I think, yeah, I agree with what Molly said. I think that the challenge is in the art of it is you don't, everything doesn't have, you can have a combination. Everything doesn't have to be a standard and, or a guideline. It's not a binary question or answer. We find the most successful communities generally have a blend. Uh, certain things are really important to communities. So let's make sure they're standardized and required other things type of trim brackets types of things like that that are nice but not deal breakers you can make those recommendations um you know so i think the the combinations of shoulds the recommendations and the shells the standards are really what makes for a successful uh, design review and and one yeah. way i think that you can um strengthen your ability with the shoulds or the, the guidelines so to speak um, is like we talked about before with that streamlining review process. Um, I, we deleted it, Jen, but maybe we shouldn't have. There's, uh, we have an example here in the city of Rochester. There was a multi-million dollar, um, $10 million dollar. In, investment, um, multi, you know, multi-story mixed use investment in, in downtown um, that because it met all of the expectations, so not necessarily the hard and fast requirements, but here's the things we wanted to see. It was a great project. It was when can you start, right? Um, it was approved in a little over 30 days. And the only reason why that was held up is because of Seeker. It was a it was an administrative approval process. You checked all our boxes. We love it. Go ahead. Um, so, you know, there's ways that you can streamline that um, to really incentivize the type of de uh, development you want to see. And the other thing I would add on to the design discussion is if you go that direction, whether it's guidelines or standards, I mean, we do think standards have their place, but get help, you know, get a professional architect. Um, you know, boards don't really have a problem reaching out to make sure, to engineers to make sure that the drainage is going to be correct or the environmental impacts are correct. And that's completely appropriate. But very few boards, in my opinion, take this level, that step with architecture or design. Uh, you, and you can, you can set your codes up to allow you as a board member to, or board as a group to reach out to an architect to say, we want someone else's opinion on the building design or the site layout on this, just from an aesthetic standpoint, not from a functional standpoint. Um, so I think if you're looking at design in any way, give yourself the, uh, the ability and the option to go get professional guidance um, for the tougher projects. And I just put our contact information in the chat too, just you know, just in case I don't want anybody to feel like, I know we're a little bit over, but we're happy to keep answering questions if there are some. No, it's extra innings here. And it's always appreciated. Um, we will archive uh, the presentation to folks. 
I do want to encourage people. We're going to have another session next week, Wednesday, one o'clock. That's going to be engaging the public in COVID era lessons learned from the new normal. And that's going to be made possible by our presenting sponsor, the MRB group next week. Next week, Wednesday, one o'clock. It's a good alliteration. It works real well. I want to thank John and Molly so much for their time. I want to thank Barton and Lagudas for their sponsorship. We, again, we, we, we have... You know, we have sponsors and we have presenters that are wearing both hats. It's really fantastic to be able to provide this great content. I'm going to ask them to come back at some point. You can bet I'll knock on the door because this is such great material. I think and next time I may ask them to do more because there's the opportunity to. There's so much There's so much material here. And and for somebody that, that's on a board myself, it's really fantastic to hear about these best practices. Um, so, again, thank you so much for taking the time with us this afternoon. Really appreciate folks for joining us. We hope to see you next week. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye.